This is a review of Unit 6 of AP U.S. Government and Politics entitled The Presidency, Bureaucracy, and Federal Budget. Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution stipulates that there are only three requirements to run for the Presidency of the United States, and they are being at least 35 years old, a natural-born United States citizen, and a 14-year resident of the United States. Though those are the only three requirements in the Constitution, there are several informal qualities that Americans have come to expect from the people who run for the highest office. Some of those include prior political experience, some experience within the military, a college education, as well as good communication skills, and a strong public image. As our republic has changed, the presidency has changed with it, and there are several constitutional amendments that AP government students should know that relate to the presidency. The Twelfth Amendment created a separate ballot for the Electoral College to vote for a president and a vice president, eliminating the situation in which the runner-up would become VP. The Twentieth Amendment actually changed the president's inauguration date from March to January 20th, getting rid of the lame duck presidency effect for those who were outgoing of office. The Twenty-second Amendment addressed the issue following Franklin Roosevelt's four consecutive terms, now limiting the president to only two consecutive four-year terms or a maximum of ten years in office. And finally, the 25th Amendment establishes a formal succession line to the presidency if something should happen to the man in office. The territorial boundaries of the president's power has been much disputed in recent decades, but let's take a look at those powers as they are listed in the Constitution versus those that have gone beyond constitutional provisions. The Constitution gives the president several powers, and they include some of the following. Faithfully executing laws, sending and receiving ambassadors, serving as the commander-in-chief of the military, signing or vetoing legislation, granting pardons or reprieves, appointing all federal judges, delivering a State of the Union each year to Congress, and proposing a federal budget each year. Though the President has given these powers directly in the Constitution, he has also used powers that have gone beyond his constitutional authority. We call these types of powers inherent powers. Some of these types of powers include the use of the executive order, which has the same force of a law but does not need Congress's approval, executive agreements, which have the same force as a treaty but don't need the Senate's approval, the use of executive privilege, which allows the President to withhold secure information from Congress. This, of course, became a highly disputed power in the Supreme Court decision of the United States versus Nixon, in which President Richard Nixon tried to claim that he could use executive privilege to withhold tapes from Congress that implicated him in the Watergate break-in. The Supreme Court, of course, ruled unanimously that executive privilege cannot be used to cover up crimes. And finally, expansion of territory is considered an inherent power, as Thomas Jefferson used this power during the Louisiana Purchase. The President's power of veto does come with some limitations, as he has two types of vetoes that he can use and one that he cannot. Of course, the regular veto comes when the President rejects a bill that has been passed by both houses of Congress. By rejecting the bill, he actually is forced to reject the entire bill and send it back. The pocket veto is within its final ten days of a congressional session in which the President chooses simply not to act on the bill. This causes it to veto by default. Remember, the President does not have the power to use what is called a line item veto in which he could reject a portion of the bill without rejecting the entire bill. This is, however, a power that is given to the governors of each individual state. Our Founding Fathers intended for a constant power struggle to take place between the executive and legislative branches as a part of our system of checks and balances. For everything the President can do, Congress has an answer for it, as it keeps the system more democratic in the eyes of those who framed our Constitution. For example, when the President vetoes a piece of legislation that Congress has passed, they still have the ability to override that veto with a two-thirds vote in both houses. The President has the chance to propose a budget, but it's Congress who has the final say with the power of the purse to approve that budget. The President, of course, can deploy troops without Congress's approval, but to get a declaration of war, he must go through Congress. The President also can appoint federal judges, cabinet secretaries, and agency heads within the bureaucracy, but all of those people have to be confirmed through the Senate advice and consent power. He also has the ability to sign treaties with foreign diplomats, but those treaties don't become official until the Senate ratifies them with a two-thirds vote. And of course, he's responsible for proposing and enforcing policy, but if he doesn't do it effectively or goes outside the boundaries of the Constitution, he can be impeached or removed by Congress. During the 1970s, Congress took several actions to try to exert a little bit more power back over the presidency. This was ignited in large part due to their feeling of mismanagement over the Vietnam War, in which they felt that the presidents involved had abused their power of commander-in-chief and lied to Congress through the exposure of the Pentagon Papers that were released in 1971 by the Supreme Court order. Thus, in 1973, Congress finally acted to try to take some of this power back with the War Powers Resolution. It included several stipulations, including the fact that the President can still deploy troops without Congress's approval, but should give them 48 hours' notice. 
Also, troops should not be committed to any place in the world for more than 60 days without a formal declaration of war, though the President can apply for a 30-day extension. The Congress also reserves the right to take these troops back and bring them home within the 60-day period if they feel that things are not going smoothly. It is important to remember that though the War Powers Resolution is law, modern presidents have basically ignored the War Powers Resolution, believing that if its constitutionality would come up in the Supreme Court, it could get shot down by judicial review. In terms of money, presidents in many decades have tried to impound funds that Congress had already allocated for political reasons. With the passage of the Congressional Impoundment Act, this helped clear this up a little bit more, with provisions such as saying that there must be a fixed budget calendar, that both houses of Congress should have their own budget committees, and that the CBO should study the budget that is handed down by the President and his OMB to make sure that it is carefully planned out. Closest to the President on a daily basis are the members that he chooses to employ on his White House staff. For example, the Chief of Staff is a person employed by the President who has the highest ranking spot on the staff as he handles all the President's appointments and his personal calendar and oversees the daily operations of the White House. The Press Secretary handles all the media communications and transmits the message of the administration each day to the press. Then there is the National Security Advisor, a very important post in the White House since the 1970s, as this person works closely with the President and consults with him on matters of foreign policy and protection. It is important to remember that even though all the people in the White House staff do help the President carry out his daily responsibilities, none of them have a direct role in policy making or the implementation of policy. Thus, no one who is employed by the White House staff has to be approved by the U.S. Senate. When it comes to planning his policy proposals, is a job that's better left to his executive office to consult him with. The executive office of the president has three separate strands, first of which is the National Security Council, or NSC, which brings his state and defense departments together to make sure that there's consistency between our foreign policy and our military strategy. Then his Council of Economic Advisors, who are professional economists that advise the President on the best types of policies to see us help combat things like inflation and unemployment while creating prosperity for as many Americans as possible. But perhaps his most important strand of the Executive Office is his OMB, or Office of Management and Budget. These are the folks that actually help the President put together his budget that he proposes to Congress each year. This is very important to remember that every member of each of the three strands of the Executive Office have direct influence on the types of policies that the President will propose and the way that these policies get enforced. Because of that, every single member of the Executive Office must be approved by the Senate through the advice and consent power. The President is of course only one man, so to enforce and implement policies he must rely heavily on his cabinet, which is comprised of 15 departments today. A couple of departments to be familiar with include the Department of State, in which the Secretary of State holds the post of handling all diplomatic relations with foreign countries and regulating our foreign policy. John Kerry is the current U.S. Secretary of State. The Department of Defense also controls all of our military policies. Chuck Hagel is the current Secretary of Defense. And, of course, there is the Department of Justice, the only department in which the leader is not given the title of Secretary. The Attorney General oversees the entire court system and the enforcement of due process at each level. Eric Holder is the current U.S. Attorney General. Within each cabinet department, there are a series of employees who work underneath of the Secretary, or in this case Attorney General, as we take a look on the screen at the composition of the Justice Department. It branches down more and more the further you go as you get closer and closer to the state level, as there are several different bureaus and regulatory agencies that work within one cabinet department. This is what makes the bureaucracy so wide and vast, and what makes implementing policy very complicated. Of all the cabinet departments, it is the Defense Department that overwhelmingly has the most employees that trickles down not just from the federal level, but to the state and local levels. Thus, defense spending is also the biggest when it comes to the cabinet levels. The President's relationship with his cabinet can be a very interesting struggle to watch. Presidents have been known to shake up the composition of their cabinets numerous times within their same presidential term. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was infamous for this, as he believed that shaking up his cabinet regularly led for great debate and made for great policy discussions. Presidents can sometimes become frustrated with their cabinets, as they have personal political goals that they want to see accomplished, but the cabinet agencies must work in an independent fashion and have to enforce policies in a nonpartisan way. Also, the president can create cabinet-level positions to aid him, but he needs Congress's approval for those positions to be funded within the budget. All of the cabinet departments, as well as the thousands of regulatory commissions and agencies that work within them and are a part of their budget, 
including executive agencies and government corporations like the U.S. Postal Service, are all members of what we call the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is the collective group of departments and agencies that are funded through our government with the responsibility of enforcing the policies that are passed by Congress and regulating various products and services within our economy. Take a look at the line that says independent regulatory commissions. These are the types of agencies that we see on a regular basis that regulate things that we have come to expect within our economy. Take, for example, the Federal Communications Commission, which is responsible for monitoring TV waves, cell phone waves, and radios, and sometimes using censoring if they believe that something is inappropriate for a certain audience. Then there's the Federal Trade Commission, which makes sure that the advertising that goes into products is actually truthful. The Securities and Exchange Commission oversees Wall Street and makes sure that trading that's going on is actually legal. And then, of course, there's the Federal Reserve Board, which has a very important task when it comes to our economy. The Federal Reserve, created in 1913 by President Woodrow Wilson, was considered his crowning achievement of his presidency. The idea was to take the monetary side, or supply of money, out of the hands of the government, as it would create a conflict of interest to have the people spending the money in control of its supply. The Federal Reserve sets up central banking systems throughout the country and is responsible for supplying banks with their money. This is what we call U.S. monetary policy. There are three tools that the Fed, short for Federal Reserve, uses to control our supply of money or monetary policy. The first and most important of which is the control of the discount rate. This, of course, is the rate that impacts the interest rates that banks will charge consumers when they go in to take out a loan, such as one for a car or for a home. A low discount rate is good, as this means banks will charge consumers low amounts of interest and allow them to take out more loans. They also control the reserve requirement, which tells banks how much money they must hold on to and not loan out. Again, a low reserve requirement is good as banks will have that money available to give out as loans. Finally, they also control the selling of government bonds, known as open market operations, which helps bring money into the government as a source of revenue. Since it is the job of any bureaucratic agency to regulate or enforce policies on private industries, it's important to understand the relationship that bureaucratic agencies have with the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. It's important to understand that agencies actually regularly consult with the industries that they're supposed to be policing. For example, the Environmental Protection Agency will consult regularly with environmental scientists to get an idea for what types of guidelines and requirements they should set in terms of clean air or water requirements. They also will use the expertise of the people from the field to help them go to Congress and tell them what types of budget requests they need to make their agency run effectively. Agencies will also actively recruit members from the industry they're regulating to come work for them. For example, the Food and Drug Administration may look to people who work in the pharmaceutical field since they have an in-depth understanding about the types of drugs that will be regulated by the FDA. The bureaucracy's job of implementing the policies passed by Congress today can be very difficult and can be very frustrating to many Americans. Here are some of the reasons why implementing policy is very difficult today and frustrating for many of the people who have to deal with it. The size of the bureaucracy includes many, many agencies, and as they increase at the state and local level, it creates more obstacle for people to get around. Agencies also get to exercise almost complete independence in the way they choose to implement the policy, since the policies are written in such a vague and unclear way that the agencies pretty much get to make their own rules. Three, there are tons of what we call red tape or standard operating procedures that people must go through in order to get in touch with a bureaucrat. Agencies have to document the work they're doing, and because of that, it can make the process very lengthy. Four, there's a shortage of resources because the budget each year can only give out so much money to each agency to use. And finally, it's what we call fragmentation. To regulate just one item within the economy or one industry, it could take many different agencies to regulate all the various aspects. Because they're overlapping all over the place, it gets pretty expensive to regulate an industry. The bureaucracy is one of the three components that makes up the Iron Triangle or sub-government policy-making theory. The Iron Triangle holds that each of the three institutions, the bureaucracy, interest groups, and Congress, each hold benefits that help each other out in the policy-making process. Let's take a look at an example of how the Iron Triangle would work in practice. Say, for example, that there had been an issue of an influx of teenagers dying in drunk driving incidents. This may cause an interest group like Mothers Against Drunk Driving to go out publicly and try to influence Congress members to pass policies that make it stricter on people who go out and get behind the wheel of a car drunk. They'll try to lobby the Congress members to get them to pass a law that benefits the group. In return, the members of Congress will likely ask for support from the members of the group when it comes election time in terms of campaign donations and their votes in the election. 
Where does the bureaucracy fit in? Well, once the Congress passes the law that MAD once passed, they're going to have to rely on the Department of Justice and the several agencies underneath of it to enforce that policy in a way that actually is approved by the Mothers Against Drunk Driving. In the end, all three have a responsibility, but all three will also benefit, as if the Department of Justice does a good enough job enforcing the policies, they may get a higher budget from Congress who holds the power of the purse. Although it is true that the bureaucracy exercises a great deal of independence in policy implementation, there are methods that are built in place to allow both the President and Congress to oversee their activities. In terms of controlling his own bureaucracy, the President can do the following things. He, of course, has the power to appoint the agency heads, use executive orders to make members comply with his requests, reorganize an agency that he believes is not working effectively, or change his budget requests based on the performance of an agency. In terms of congressional or legislative oversight, Congress can do the following things. The Senate has the ability to confirm or deny an appointment to the agency head positions by the President. They can hold investigative hearings to try to expose corruption that may be going on. They also can alter an agency's budget request. And finally, Congress can go back and rewrite a law that they believe that they left too open for interpretation and make the implementation policies more strict and clear. Jobs within the bureaucracy were historically handed out as political gifts and a process known as patronage. Patronage was awarding a bureaucratic job solely based on party loyalty or political favor and not on the merit or competency of the person who's going for the job. This was also referred to by some as the spoils system. Patronage officially came to an end with the passage of the Pendleton Civil Service Act in 1883, which created a merit-based civil service system to be overseen by the U.S. Civil Service Commission. It includes entry-level exams to get into a bureaucratic job and a general schedule pay scale that rewards people based on their experience and their competency. The Hatch Act in 1939 took things a step further by preventing bureaucrats from participating in campaigning or electioneering. The construction of the federal budget requires cooperation between the executive and legislative branches. It is the president and his office of management and budget that actually propose a budget each year, and then the congressional budget office studies this budget and gives it out to the two budget committees in both houses of Congress. They study it, make amendments, and eventually, because Congress has the power of the purse, they vote on approving a final budget. The first step of making a budget is understanding how much money that you have to work with. That is, how much revenue do you have or money being brought into the Treasury through the methods used by government to bring this money in. The most common source of revenue today is still the federal income tax, which comes out of each American's paycheck. The federal income tax is considered a progressive tax because the more income that a person has, the higher the percentage of taxes that they're going to pay. The government does still also bring in money through borrowing, through the use of selling government bonds to its own people, and taking out loans from foreign countries. In terms of appropriating or spending money, the government has two types of expenditures, those that are mandatory or uncontrollable versus those that are discretionary and can be changed each year. Some examples of things that are uncontrollable in the budget each year include spending on entitlement programs, war veterans aid, and paying down the interest on our national debt. However, the government can alter the budget of the cabinet departments and the various agencies that work underneath of it, as this could be added or subtracted based on need each year. By far the government's biggest uncontrollable expenditure are entitlement programs. These are programs that are created by the government and guarantee certain benefits to people once they become eligible. Our biggest entitlement program has always been Social Security, which provides income to retirees and disabled Americans. In addition to Social Security, there's Medicare, which provides medical insurance to those who are retired, unemployment insurance for those who are temporarily out of work, and food stamps, which helps low-income Americans to feed their families. When looking at a copy of the most recent proposed budget by the President and the OMB, you can see how much we heavily rely on entitlement programs for our spending. Approximately 60 cents of every U.S. dollar is paid in entitlement programs. It is important to remember, however, that many of the things that we take for granted and need on a daily basis, such as roads and bridges, hospitals and schools, are not fully funded by the federal government, and thus the individual states have to come up with most of the funding. Here are some means of revenue that states have for bringing in some money. Some states include their own state income tax. Some states actually charge a sales tax when you purchase products within their state. This is typically a flat percentage, and because of that, some refer to it as a regressive tax, since it will affect lower-income people more than higher-income people. Also, some states charge things like tolls and gas taxes, and they have their own lotteries and gaming systems, like horse racing and slot machines, as another way to bring in funding for the state. In the end, putting together a budget will lead to one of two things, either a budget surplus or a budget deficit. 
If the amount of money that you have coming in, that is your revenue, exceeds the amount of money that you're appropriating or spending, you'll be left with a surplus. However, what has been more common of our government in recent decades is running a budget deficit in which we are spending or appropriating more money than we're actually bringing in in revenue. I hope that this review of AP U.S. Government and Politics Unit 6, the Presidency, Bureaucracy, and the Federal Budget, has helped you. Good luck on the AP exam in May.